Hello, DGRE partners and future DGRE partners, and welcome to the January 2021 DGRE meeting. My name is Brian Holly. I'm president of Darcourt Management. Darwin will also be on with us tonight, and our entire team is actually on a standby to assist if needed. First of all, we want to thank everybody for your time this evening and are very excited about the information we have to share with you especially the two new investment opportunities, which Darwin will address toward the end of the presentation. We certainly hope that each of you had a terrific holiday season and a grand new year. And as we move into 2021, we truly wish we could host this meeting live in our new meeting room, which is where I am right now, but are thankful that we still have the ability to get together virtually and share this information with our partners. The intent of these meetings is to keep you, our partners, up to date with your investments. As you know, we are always about the good, the bad, the ugly. We're always very honest, open, and transparent with you, and keeping with our motto, always in the best interest of our partners. So let's review our agenda and get started. The first thing we're gonna talk about tonight is gonna to be the COVID relief package. This is really just to give you an update. The COVID relief package recently passed by Congress and what this means for us and how it affects our properties. What proactive steps are we taking to make sure that we can take advantage of this? Then I will review the 2020 DGRE portfolio performance, but this will be very different from our previous month's information. Tonight, in the spirit of full transparency, I will compare the 2020 actual performance versus the budgeted or projected performance. Each year, we create a budget for every property that provides goals and serves as a guideline for property performance. What you will see tonight is how the property performed to the budgeted expectations that we set at the beginning of 2020 or actually at the end of 2019. I will then officially announce, and uh, very happy to do so, officially announce tonight a new stream of revenue or income for the properties that we will implement in 2021. This is really very exciting news and it's going to be uh, welcomed by everyone. Darwin will then join in and give you his assessment of 2021 multifamily markets. What do his years of experience tell him about what we can expect in 2021? He will also discuss the 2021 DGRE strategy and how we will adapt to the changing land landscapes. Darwin will then very briefly discuss two new investment opportunities, which we're going to roll out, and then we're going to open it up for questions, and we'll do the best we can to address them all. Please type your questions in as we go through the presentation, and we'll address them at the end, and uh, it could be me answering, could be Darwin, or we might ask uh, our team to chime in, but we'll do our best to answer any and all questions that come forward. Okay, let's get started. Let's talk about the rental right. assistance or yes. You need to I can you share your screen? Because I don't see your screen. Uh I thought I saw that. Everybody doesn't see that? Do you see it there now? You know. Yep. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Good. Okay, sorry. First thing we're gonna do is talk about the rental assistance or the COVID relief package. This is the 25 billion rental assistance package that was part of the 900 billion dollar COVID relief package past re recently by Congress. What is this, what we really wanna talk about tonight is what we think we know. This is the information that has been shared with us to this point. These programs have not yet been implemented, but we are absolutely preparing for them and to uh, make sure that we can take advantage of them as best we can in the interest of the property. So let's talk about what we do know at this point. We do know that the federal government will allocate predetermined amounts of money to the states for rental assistance. The states will either provide the rental assistance via the state and or local housing agencies. I get a lot of questions about what might be covered by this rental uh, assistance package. Bottom line is past due rent for the last nine months and or future rent up to three more months can be covered. Past due utilities for the last nine months and future utilities for the next three months are all, can also be covered. The CDC ev eviction ban, unfortunately, has been extended through January 31st, 2021. I will also tell you that this is really just a stopgap measure. Uh, it is absolutely expected that this will be extended and or modified in some way post-inauguration day once the new 
um, administration comes in. Now, who is eligible for assistance? Well, the tenant is eligible for assistance. That's your existing tenants. Anybody that was an existing tenant through uh, prior to 2020, and it's the tenants that during COVID, the tenant made less than 80% or less of the median income in the area which the asset is located, so where the pro property is. These tenants will also have to attest that someone in their household is at risk of homelessness or risk of housing instability. And instability can be uh, late utility or rental payments. Here is really the big difference on the assistance package, um, how it affects us today is that it's actually us, it's the management company, it's the landlords that re can request the back rent and the future rent of existing tenants that qualify. While the landlord can apply for the rental assistant, the tenant is still required to sign the forms. So you can see this is gonna have to be a partnership. Once the payment has been made, the applicable state or local housing authority will send notice to the tenant that the payment has been made. What we're being told is that the money is going to be prioritized, um, you know, in that during COVID, those tenants whose income does not exceed 50% of the median income, they're going to be first in line in the area to which the asset is located. Also, any tenant unemployed for the last 90 days and or at risk of homelessness or housing instability. So as you can see here, this is going to be, have to be a cooperative effort. What we do know is that this will, first of all, this is probably not going to roll out for another two, three, sometimes four weeks. We also know that like any other government program, this is really going to be a first come, first serve. So what is incumbent upon us and what we are actively doing already uh, is that we are gathering information. And when I say that, we're going back and uh, creating a file for each one of our tenants that are still in our properties and owe us money and are protected under the CDC eviction. You know, whether it's uh, collecting the leases, whether it's connect, uh, collecting the tenant ledgers, we're going to need to work with the tenants themselves to get a copy of their unemployment benefits. We're going to need to work with the tenant themselves uh, to verify income. So we're talking about getting pay stubs from them and or any other information that may prove a direct effect of the economic impact from COVID. Bottom line is we're creating and gathering all of that information as we speak, we want to be ultra ready. And when the program is rolled out, then we'll be the first in line uh, applying for this assistance. But it will have to be a partnership with the, uh, with the tenant. Okay, let's move on to the 2020 DGRE portfolio performance. I'm gonna explain this a little bit because it's a little bit confusing slide, my apologies, but I wanna explain what I'm trying to convey to you here. The numbers that you see in the columns are the 2020 monthly averages. The top number is our actual performance, and the bottom number was our 2020 budgeted performance or expected performance. For example, and I think it'll make more sense as we go through here, let's just look at Amber Vista, for example. The average occupancy in 2020 was 94%. Now, the average income that we achieved was, as you can see, almost $108,000 a month. Our budgeted or projected income for that prop for Amber Vista was 112,000. So as you can see, there's about a 47, $4,600 difference in what was budgeted versus what was achieved. Operating expenses, budgeted was just over $58,000. We achieved uh, just over $59,000, so a little discrepancy there as well. The NOI average, budgeted 54,000, achieved 48,000. Really what I want to draw your attention to is, is, again, just to kind of give you some insight as to the shortcomings of the property performance. Uh, none of us are happy that we did not meet projected uh, numbers, but having said that, we do know that there were some unique challenges to 2020, and we just want to give you a full picture of what went on. If you look in the delinquency average, we budgeted just over $851 a month in delinquency at Amber Vista. Our actual delinquency, based upon all of the, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we're, there was a lot of fees that we could not collect, the, the fact that we could not evict people, uh, our actual delinquency was a little over $5,100. So you can see there's almost a, you know, about a $4,000 difference. If you were to take that $4,000 from our delinquency average and put it over there in our actual income of almost 108, you can see we would be right at our income number of 112. And then obviously our NOI 
would be much more in line with where we expected it to be. So now that we've gone through one of these, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit each one individually per se, or spend a lot of time on each one, but I do just wanna draw some highlights. Let's move on to Brookside. A occupancy average of 97%. Budgeted income or expected income that we set at the end of 2019 for this property was 296,000. We actually averaged 283,000. As you can see, that's about a $13,000 short come in uh, monthly income. However, I'll point to your operating expenses. What was budgeted was 151,000. We ran the property at 142,000, so about a $9,000 in our favor on the operating side. And that's, you're gonna see that kind of across the board in that as income was not achieved, we were also doing everything we could to reduce expenses so that we could keep our NOI where we wanted it to be. Average uh, budgeted NOI for Brookside was 145, achieved was 140. Again, if you look at our delinquency, we budgeted about $3,500. Actual delinquency was about 7,700. So that $4,000 spread, again, if you could put that back over in our income, uh, then we would be much, much closer to where we wanted to be, especially if you added that to the NOI, we would be right in line with the NOI. As we go through here, and as I make different, uh, different comparisons for different properties, I'll also remind you that there was uh, some income shortfall due to some challenges in 2020, and I'm gonna delineate those for you a little bit later in the presentation. But also keep in mind that the fact that we could not evict people means that we could not turn those units. There was income that we were missing. There was late fees that we could not charge for six months. There was risk and application and admin fees that we could not charge because those are charges and or fees associated with a new person moving into the property. And if we could not turn the units or get out the people that were not paying, then that left units that we could not turn for new people. So again, we'll go through this. Corners, average 88% occupancy. Keep in mind, we only owned corners for just over two months of 2020, uh, but our income, expect our projected income 96, achieved 92. Expenses, budgeted 53, achieved 40. So you can see we were really good on the operating expenses, which means that even though we were a little bit behind on income, about 4,000 behind on income, we're actually ahead uh, about eight or $9,000 in the NOI. And again, that's because just a great job by the property staff in managing the operating expenses. So budgeted NOI was 43, we actually achieved 42. Uh, you can see the difference there. We budgeted $818 for delinquency and it was almost 6,000. Again, if you could add that back to the income you could and to the NOI, then you could see where corners were really super excited about where we feel like we should be. Crossings, 95%, budgeted 103, achieved 101 in income. Operating expenses were budgeted at 56. We actually ran it at 58. So we're about $4,000 again off on the NOI. You can actually see at, <clears throat> excuse me, at the crossings, we were actually better on delinquency, so a great job there by the staff. We budgeted a little over $2,000 a month and we're actually able to keep that at around $1,300. So the discrepancy there that you see uh, at the crossings is more, uh, a more a function of the fees that we could not charge for much of the year. So if we could add those fees back in, that property would just be cooking and cooking and meeting all expectations. <clears throat> Gold Creek, real quickly, 95% occupancy. It is uh, 295 is our expected or projected income, 287 was our actual income. You can see the operating expenses were right in line with what we budgeted. NOI, there's about a $6,000 difference. Again, same thing at Gold Creek. Our delinquency is not, not really a big problem there. Yes, there's about $1,000 more per month than was budgeted. But again, this is more about the income that we could not collect. Uh, in regards to late fees, eviction fees, application fees, risk fees, admin fees, you name it across the board. I'd also like to point out to you and, and let you know that Brookside, Corners, Crossings, and Gold Creek have all been put on what we call a rent optimizer program. It's called Yield Star. This program uses many data, uh, I'm sorry, uses data from many sources to optimize rents daily. This vastly reduces the guessing game of how much the rent structure can be pushed at each property and pro provides much faster reaction to market conditions. We're really excited about being on YieldStar and we expect a positive increase uh, in our property somewhere between one and a half and 2% in income 
just due to yield star because again it reacts to the to being able to push the rents on a daily basis as opposed to waiting really what we have to do towards the end of a month and make some you know our best guesses next slide we've got another group of properties here I don't have any budgeted information for Halinani and Kainani. It's, uh, as you all know, we don't manage those properties. That's managed by an outfit in, in Hawaii, and they don't really do budgets the same way we do. So what I provided you here is just, again, an average income and average expenses and average NOI and average delinquency for the month. We are very happy with the way Halinani and Kainani have bounced back after the COVID problems of 2020 um, and really, uh, really uh, pleased with the performance there. Oakview, 92% average occupancy. And again, what I have provided you are the average numbers. Keep in mind, I do not have a budget for Oakview because we only own that. We knew that we were only gonna own that for less than one month of 2020. So there really wasn't much sense in creating a budget for the 2020. A Couple of things I do wanna point out in regards to Oakview though, is you look at the expenses and the NOI. The expenses is artifi are artificially low, and the NOI is artificially high because we had no financing costs, no mortgage costs for the month of December. So you will certainly see as we move into the following uh, subsequent months, as we do comparisons as we have done in previous months, you will see that those operating expenses absolutely will go up and that NOI average absolutely will go down. Ridgemar Plaza, again, 92% occupied, 48 budgeted income, 44 achieved, 26 operating income, operating expenses budgeted, 27 achieved. It's about a $5,000 variance there in the NOI average. Again, some of that about, you know, almost 2,000 of that can be achieved to the delinquency uh, that we were not able to collect and the rest of it again to income fees that we were just unable to collect. Riverbend, 95%, 175 budgeted income, 169 operating in expenses, 81 budgeted, 83 achieved, uh, a difference there. Your NOI average is about uh, what, about $8,000 difference. Um, one of our, as those of you who've been on our monthly calls know that Riverbend is a unique challenge. It's just a little bit different demographic. And as you can see, we had about a $6,000 spread and what we budgeted for delinquency as opposed to what was achieved. It's just uh, really, really difficult to get, uh, to get money from some of these folks. And uh, the courts were not extremely cooperative. But again, if you take that $6,000 spread on our delinquency and put that back over in our income average and our NOI average, you can see that we're uh, very, very pleased with Riverbend and are uh, you know, excited about moving forward at Riverbend. No real big problems there. Uh, we just need to uh, get past these uh, 2020 income challenges and, and the CDC ban and uh, be smooth sailing. Southwest, 93%, budgeted 63, achieved 59. Operating expenses budgeted 39, operating expenses achieved 38, about a $4,000 spread in the NOI average. Again, you can see about 3,000 of that 4,000 spread is due to delinquency issues, not being able to evict and collect uh, rents. Riverbend also wanna let you know has been put on the same Yield Star Rent Optimizer program. So those are our five properties that I mentioned before. Okay, moving on to the last slide here. Uh, for our property performance. Silver Creek, 93% occupancy average. Our income average, as you can see, uh, we budgeted 308,000 a month. We achieved 294. Operating expenses, however, were budgeted at $160,000 a month, and we were able to achieve a 145. So again, you can see that as we recognize that our income level was not exactly where we wanted it to be, and was going to be a challenge, we adjusted our operating expenses as best we could, and we're about $15,000 positive on the monthly operating expenses. So if you look at the Silver Creek NOI, we're actually achieved better NOI than what we budgeted, about $1,000 better. That is on top, that is including the $7,000 delinquency uh, average that we had there from our budgeted to our actual performance. So again, if you can see that if we could take that, if we could have collected that money, that $7,000 spread, put it back on our income average, and then add it to our NOI, we would be much, much happier and everybody would be much, much happier with Silver Creek. So uh, while we're not ever satisfied, um, uh, we're, we're kind of okay with what happened in 2020 and that we were able to adapt and adjust. Uh, we just got to keep pushing, pushing. 
1019, huge success story. You've heard me say this before. Uh, our budgeted income was $120,000. We actually achieved 127. Our budgeted expenses at 69, we actually achieved at 62. So our NOI budgeted was 51 and we're actually achieving it at 64. So those of you who are 1019 partners, congratulations. It is a tremendous success despite the challenges of uh, 2020. You can uh, see that we're, we're a little bit behind on the delinquency, but again, if we could cover that spread, that just adds to the uh, successes of 2019 for 1019 property. So uh, great success story. Congratulations to those partners. I also want to point out that the occupancy average at 1019, it's, it says it's only 92%. We're actually in the 98% range, but keep in mind when we when Dark Corp took over that property from previous management, it was less than 70% occupied. So uh, getting that 70% all the way up to 92 has been a tremendous, and again, we're, we're past that now, but uh, again, just great, great uh, job by the staff there at 1019. Very, uh, very happy with that. Valley Center, as we talked about, occupancy average is figured on square foot not on the actual number of units occupied. Again, we don't have a budget, didn't have a budget for 2020 for Valley Center, and that's simply because we just didn't really have good financials from the previous owner, and all budgets going into a new year are really based upon the performance of the previous year, and we tweak them and we make um, adaptations and adjustments to where we know we're going to be more efficient as a management company, so don't really have any uh, numbers to compare it here to. But again, you can see that our average income is 120, average expense is 42 for an NOI of around $77,000, very low delinquency issues. Village Oaks, one of our newer properties that we've only had for actually for less than three months, about two and a half months. Again, don't have budgeted information for you because we uh, were only had it two months of the year, a little over two months of the year, so we did not create a budget. But again, uh, you can see the average income, average operating expenses and NOI. I do want to point out one thing. You see the asterisk there on the income and the asterisk on the, the delinquency. The income looks artificially low and uh, the delinquency really looks high. And you're right, it does. Anytime you take over a property, there is always an adjustment period. And when I say that is getting all of the, we have, we have a fairly high percentage of our tenants at Village Oaks are housing on some sort of housing and trying to work with each one of the different housing entities and getting them to stop sending checks to the previous owner and sending checks to the current owner is always about a 30, 60, sometimes 90 day process. So when you see that delinquency, don't be concerned. That is just the housing payments that we know we're gonna get. We're just not exactly sure when we're gonna get it. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week. We've gotten some of them, but there's still quite a bit of that. Uh, the vast majority of that is actually outstanding housing payments that were just waiting on the check to be sent to us. Villa Creek, 92%, budgeted at 168, actual income 164, budgeted expenses at 93, we uh, achieved at 94, we got a spread of about $5,000 at Villa Creek on our NOI, no we're not happy with that, uh, great kudos with the, to the staff here because, again, you can see they were ahead on budgeted uh, delinquency. We actually budgeted about $1,700 a month. They actually averaged about $343 a month. I will tell you that the Villa Creek income is a little bit different story. When we did the budget for 2019, we assumed and expected that the 14 down units, you all know if you were in Villa Creek that we had 14 tornado damaged units that were totally out of commission. We expected those to be back online by the end of the first quarter of 2020. In actuality, everything takes a little bit longer when you're dealing with uh, contractors and inspections and everything else with the city. And we actually did not get those back to us to put back in the inventory and begin leasing and getting income until the end of the second quarter, start of the third quarter. So I feel very confident in saying, had we had those, at the end of the first quarter, which is, was our expectations at the end of 2019, we would be right on or exceeding our number for Villa Creek. Last but not least, 2405 at Park Row, uh, average occupancy of 85% for the year, average uh, budgeted income 36, achieved 29, operating expenses budgeted was 20,000, uh, operating expenses achieved 17, again, a good job of lowering the expenses to try and get closer. NOI is about a $4,000 spread on our NOI on a monthly average. 
But again, look at our delinquency, not making excuses, but it is what it is. We budgeted about $531,000 and our delinquency average there is about $7,000. So as you can see, if we could collect that money, put that back over in our income and our NOI, um, then a 2405 Park Row would be not only meeting expectations, but probably exceeding expectations. Lastly, Silver Creek is the last property we want to let you know as well that we put on the Yield Star Rent Optimizer Program. And again, we expect that to be uh, a help to us as we move forward as well. To kind of recap real quickly, the 2020 performance, and I know I kind of went through that pretty quickly, but I just kind of want to recap for you. And I talked about this a little bit as we went through, but want to remind you of the 2020 challenges that we were facing. Again, these are not meant to be excuses. We're going to continue to push, 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 but just uh, want some things we need to keep in mind for some of those properties that didn't quite hit income or quite hit our NOI expectations. But keep in mind that we had an inability to charge late fees at all properties for about six months of 2020. We had an overall softening of the market rents due to the economic slowdown, and that just uh, prevented us from pushing rents as much as we would like to have pushed rents in 2020. The inability to evict for non-payment of rents Again, this means loss of rental income as well as loss of eviction fees. Yes, when we file eviction, we charge fees back to the resident that was evicted. And we obviously lost all of that uh, income because we could not kick them out or they were not paying their rent, sorry. And then the eviction fees we lost. Also keep in mind that there's another kind of domino that falls there. And when the properties are prevented from turning units for new residents, in other words, we cannot get out some of the people who are not paying, therefore those units cannot be turned for new, new residents. That's a loss of new money that would have come in from new applicants. So there's your application fees, your admin fees, and your risk fees. I'm really excited to show you here down at the bottom, uh, draw your attention to uh, what I've done here is a 2019 comparison versus 2020 comparison. Again, no excuse for 2020. We know that we had challenges. We had to deal with it. We did the best we could. But I also do want to point out that despite these challenges, the overall DoorCorp uh, portfolio performance in 2020 as opposed to 2019, these are the properties, again, the properties included on this are only the properties that we took over management for in 2020. So it would not include, for example, the four properties that we acquired in 2020. So I don't wanna give you the impression these numbers are not artificially inflated by new properties that we brought on. These are actual properties 2019 versus 2020. So NOI for those properties was a little over five and a half million dollars or a portfolio value of a five and a half percent cap rate and being a little conservative there. A little over $100 million. 2020, despite our challenges, our NOI was in 6.6 .6 million or $121 million in portfolio value for a variance. Again, a little over $1.1 million in NOI and a little over $20 million uh, added to the portfolio value the portfolio value for you, the investors. So again, congratulations, 2020, despite the challenges, was a very successful year for us. We are thrilled that, uh, that you, the investor, were able to uh, you know, benefit from that. Uh, we will continue to push, again, not using anything as excuses, we'll continue to push for better, but I did wanna share that exciting news uh, of what we're very proud of what we accomplished in 2020. You all know what that means. Here's our friend delivering uh, portfolio distributions or mailbox money. Just a real quick update. We distributed just over three and a half million dollars to our Darwin German real estate partners, you the partners. And that culminates a three year period where we've distributed just over $31 million back to our DGRE partners over 2018, 19 and 20. So again, congratulations on your success. We're actually thrilled for you. Let's move on real quickly to the new source of income for the DGRE portfolio. Really proud to announce this. What we have done is entered into a bulk agreement with uh, Charter or Spectrum, and it's going to provide the following. It's a technology package that we're going to be able to offer to our uh, residents at every single property. That technology package includes installation of the services, a router, a modem, two TV boxes, the boxes that, you know, allow you to record and what have you, 300 to 400 uh, megabytes of internet. That is enterprise-grade internet. 
you go down and get internet from your local local spectrum dealer, you're getting 100 meg unless you're paying uh, a big premium. But we're going to be offering 300 megabytes to 400 megabytes of high-speed internet to every single one of our residents and a 200 plus channel TV package. What we found is that most people are not taking advantage of the TV package. Most people are just interested in streaming, but that's fine. We've got that covered with the 300, mega, 300 to 400 megabyte uh, package. Also, again, before we get into the graph here, before we get into the chart, please understand that I'm being a little bit conservative here as we always tend to be. The estimates below are based upon the following parameters. It's based upon each of our properties being at 95% occupancy rate. It's also based on the fact that let's just say eight out of every 10, if we just do an 80% saturation rate over the first 12 months. The reason that that saturation rate can't be 100% is because we have people who are already currently in leases. We cannot change their lease or charge them a new fee. We will, however, uh, anybody that signs a new lease, anybody that's up for lease renewal, we will be implementing this fee and this package to them. We will also, I said, we can't make current people pay it. However, we will, you can believe we will be actively and very heavily marketing our new product because I can tell you right now, as you see uh, the prices we're going to be charging for this, nobody can go get this prices for this package. So we're going to be offering a great amenity for our properties at a much lower price than they would be paying, which provides them a huge incentive to lease with us, stay with us, and break their current contract. Most of those are on month to month anyway, so even if they wait till the end of the month. So let me real quickly, and I'm not going to go through every property, but just give you an idea how this works. And let's just look at Amber Vista. 88 doors. The first thing we get is a $225 signing bonus just for doing business with Spectrum Charter. So that's a $19,800 bonus that we get just for signing up for to allow them to put this service on our property. This, this package will cost us $43 per unit, okay, for the property. We will be charging, right now we anticipate charging somewhere around $83. I will tell you again, that's a conservative number. We are already have this package on the corners property and are getting $89, almost $90 for this. So there's a spread, again, what I'm being here is a little conservative. There's a spread of $40 from what our cost is for the service to what the residents will be paying. If you look at just the first year income, assuming again, 95% occupancy rate and only an 80% saturation rate, over the first 12 months, that is $51,902.40 of income to Amber Vista. What is that for our value add for our property? at a five and a half percent cap rate, $943,000. So this is just a tremendous opportunity for us. And uh, we're thrilled to offer it to our residents and offer it obviously to our investors because they're gonna be thrilled too. Let's look at a couple of the big ones here. And again, it works the same way at every property. Brookside is 288 doors. So their signing bonus is the same amount per door, but it's almost $65,000. Look at that value add almost $2 million value add because we're recognizing $105,000 income in the first year additional income versus what we did not have in 2020. Crossings, 101 doors, again, works the same way, a little over a million dollars in value add. Gold Creek, look, we're getting into some big numbers here. Gold Creek uh, could realize uh, through proper implementation, $150,000 of income for the year or almost $2.8 million in value add. Oak View, look, again, the more units you have, the, the more uh, potential. $60,000 upfront signing bonus, $160,000 annual income after the first year, $2.9 million in uh, value add. Ridgemar, apologize, Ridgemar, uh, again, works the same way with a little over uh, half a million dollars in value add for Ridgemar as well. Riverbend, again, you can see the numbers across the board. Uh, very excited about this, uh, adding a little over 822000 in value add. Silver Creek, look at that. There's a big one because that's the biggest property we have with the most doors, but a $3.5 million value add, again, at a 5.5% cap rate, which is a little bit conservative right now. Southwest, over half a million dollars. 1019, over a million and a half dollars. Village Oaks, almost a million dollars in value add due to the income in uh, the increased income for the year. Villa Creek, 1.8 million, and last but not least, 2405, 428,000. So 
very excited about this. I hope you are too. Uh, we do not exactly know. We've just signed the contracts and consummated the deal. So we're not exactly sure we can, where we can start this. What we have done though with our budgets for 2021 is that we're expecting the income to start making a difference about mid-year, June, July. By the time we get this implemented on all the properties, the good news is too, and I had somebody ask me this today, so I wanna spend just a minute on this, is that yes, we are paying $43 per unit, regardless of whether it's occupied or not. So yes, we are taking that on. However, it is a stair-stepped approach. For example, we do not have to pay for 100% of the properties on day one, only 25% of the properties. Then we get to stair-step over the next quarter, the second quarter of, of our agreement, another 25% of the properties and then another quarter in the, uh, another 25% the third quarter and so on. So we actually have a full year to get this fully implemented on our properties before all of these expenses start hitting us. So that allows us to go through everybody's lease. It allows us to go through one year of leases and get everybody on this program. So we're very, very excited about this. I hope you are too. And uh, you can see what it actually means for the properties themselves. Anybody's got any questions? Again, we'll be glad to answer those as we go. Having said that, uh, Darwin, are you out there? I am. As a matter of fact, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go through some of these questions just so that you can hit those now if you want. Okay, great. Um, first thing is, what is being done to raise the occupancy at the corners? What is being done, to be honest with you, we don't feel like we have a problem at corners. We just had, and again, this is not unusual. Anytime you take over a property, we find that there are residents that we did not receive exactly the most honest information about to begin with. So we had some residents there that we had to get out uh, that we did not anticipate having to get out. Because as you know, it was 92% when we bought, no, I'm sorry, 93% when we bought it. But what you, the drop is not attributable to any problem other than we just needed to get some people out that were not paying, that we just didn't know about when we bought the property. No leasing problems there. We're actually able to lease and you'll see that number going right back up. Okay, what about can 1019 or the other properties go on yield start? They can. Uh, the reason that we have not is, is we just wanted, number one, we did not want to inundate and overload our staff because it is a lot of work. This is about a 90 day preparation step for each property to go on Yield Star. It is very, very detailed, a lot of information, a lot of training, and we needed to make sure that we were happy with the results. So the problem, the bottom line is we put it on the properties we felt like needed the most help right away. It's been, like I said, about a 90 day process to get them on. If we're happy with it and it's working the way it, uh, we expect it to work, we fully expect it to work, then absolutely we will be putting it on more properties. Okay, good. Um, when do we expect distributions on Southwest and Oakview? Okay, Southwest, um, I don't know yet. Oakview, I would expect to be very soon. My, my and again, uh, just kind of what you know, kind of what, uh, what our philosophy is, we really need to have the property for about three months under our management before we do a distribution, just to make sure everything is correct. It may be a thing is, is what we expected with the property. Having said that, I know you're gonna point out that we managed Oakview um, for five months before we took it over. So that, that uh, three month uh, stretch is not going to be required here. I anticipate, again, the only thing we do not have with Oakview right now is our mortgage numbers. We know what they are, but we have not plugged them into our formulas yet. As you saw on the sheet that I, the spreadsheet that I did on the comparisons, I just need to see a full month operating under full expenses, full income, see what we're averaging. My expectations is for Oakview to be no later than the end of January or certainly no later than February. Okay, next question. What are the plans for Villa Creek sale? And I'll answer that. Is that actually rolled out? Um, last Tuesday, and they've already had a ton of showings and a ton of interest. So, uh, so that's moving ahead. That, of course, that'll be, you know, we'll go three weeks or so, and then do call for offers, wait a week, and negotiate with those people that did the that made the offers. Then we'll award that to somebody, and then it'll take another week or two before it goes under contract and then another 45 to 65 days to close. So we're looking at about uh, three to four months before that gets sold. And, uh, and it's nice to have that information, that extra income 
uh, projections for the cable TV, for the cable and internet, uh, the technology package to really help spike people's offers. Um, and it also, on that same note, what happens with Spectrum deal when a property is sold, I'll go ahead and jump on that one too, is generally the signing bonus is, uh, is prorated over the term and our term is five years on those. Um, that's what we would generally negotiate for as a, as a buyer. And so as a seller, I would expect that also. Um, however, the, of course, the big bonus is the cap rate value uh, on the backside. Um, but that basically transfers with the property when it's sold. Um, are we still trying to sell Ridge Bar? Um, yes, we are still start trying to sell Ridge Bar. We actually have a contract we're negotiating right now. And so there should be some more information on that once we get that signed and completed. Um, can the corners participate in the next, in the new tech package? Um, it wasn't listed. Do you want to go ahead and answer that? I'll, I know the answer. Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, the corners already had a technology package, a similar program. It was not with Spectrum and Charter, but it's a similar program that was already in place that we assumed when we bought, bought the corners. And that's the one, by the way, where we're already achieving $89. So we do feel like there's probably a little more room. I may have been a little conservative. Okay, um, I'm gonna read this question. I understand that you said you don't know about Southwest distribution time. What does that mean? What would be the future of that property? Well, for me, it really just means that again, when you have the smaller properties got a little bit harder hit in 2020 and again, no excuses, but uh, when you have a number of tenants that you cannot evict and get out, it, uh, you know, it only takes a handful of properties, I'm sorry, only a handful of tenants on a property that size to make a much bigger impact. Uh, what we're doing is making sure, as we always do, that the asset is put number one and we protect the asset. Uh, we put back into it what it needs to survive and make sure that the property is performing well. We just really need to see a good three month trend before we start distributions. And when I say that trend is we just need to see our cash our net income and our cash flow on the properties get to a consistent point as long as we're kicking out or trying to evict or evicting you know three four five six people a month and or and can't get them out then it's just not going to be stable enough at this point for us to to make that decision certainly if we can get through this and or get some of the back rent that we hope to get and or get through this eviction ban and get that back and get tenants in there that are actually paying the rent and paying the fees, then we'll take another look at it at that time. And I'll, just to add on to that same thing is that property had one of the most difficult demographics there uh, because when we bought it, it was on weekly rents and we had let that go for a few months before we decided to switch it over to monthly, um, which was right in the midst of COVID. And so we had a very difficult um, clientele there that was a weekly renter that just said they were living week to week paychecks and they've been very difficult to deal with. Um, next question is Brookside expect to be sold anytime soon? Um, Brookside, we are soft marketing that. We are not trying to actively market that. Um, after we get the technology package in there, that'll help. But we've got a, it's either 20 or $22 million loan and the defeasance on it is about six million dollars. So it would have to be an assumption, and um, and so the technology package numbers will certainly help that. You saw it adds about three three and a half million dollars on uh, going off of memory to that property with that technology package. So we might have to wait a little bit longer on that. Um, can non-paying tenants be evicted when their lease expires? Non-renewal, Ryan. Uh, the answer is yes, under certain circumstances, but not in every case. So again, it just, there are, they can still fight it. And if they can prove that they are at risk for being homeless, then we still cannot, the judge will still not give us a favor. So the answer is in most cases, yes, but not in every single case. Okay. Any other questions anybody wants to throw in there on the performance of the properties before we move on? By the way, I will point out, Brian, I'm very impressed with the slide comparing that extra value. And 
as much as uh, I'm on the phone and emailing and bitching about different things, you guys are doing a great job on the management side, you know, and, and I know no one's ever satisfied, but you guys are really working it and working it hard. So I'm very happy about that and just wanted you to know that. And Lenny also had a question, what are current cap rates? They're between five and generally five and a half, which is what he used on the slide. It's a good number is five and a half. Uh, 80s product, probably closer to a five. Um, and other tertiary markets or things like that might be a little bit higher. So, um, so that's where we are on that. Okay, last call. Um, by the way, applause. Uh, thank you, Martha. Kudos to the staff at Villa Creek for continuing to keep delinquencies low. Oh, um, question for you. Did we, did that include the lost rents, the insurance we got, the insurance for lost rents on that income number, or is that a separate, or is that a separate line item at Villa? It's actually a separate line item below. It's okay, insurance. So, so no, it does not include that income. So, so just to expand on that is insurance is basically paying for those units while they were vacant. They're paying the rent on those while they're vacant, and that's an extra influx of cash. Um, how much have we received of the lost rent so far? Uh, we've received full settlement. I think it was in the neighborhood of around $60,000. Yeah, $60,000. So if you were to use that as our additional rent on that one, then that one is actually doing much better because you didn't include the lost rents in your income number. So absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, let's see here. How will performance of 2020 impact performance of 2021? Well, I would tell you that we're shooting for bigger and better things in 2021 as we always do. We, as I told you that we do a budget for every single property and our 2021 budgets do have increases in income. They do have more efficiencies in the management. Uh, and as Darwin has said, as I presented tonight, we, we feel really good about the, uh, the new stream of income we're going to have. But the bottom line is we're always going to be looking to improve our income in every way we possibly can and manage expenses as, as possibly can. And it's really that simple. It's not a, it's not a uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, it's just about uh, implementing the right programs and holding people accountable and uh, having a great staff, which we do. Um, and um, two more questions and that's it. Is Oakview value increase estimate available? The increase in the Oakview uh, property. Well, he Brian entered that in with the technology package. So anytime you can raise rents and lower expenses then or lower expenses, you increase the value of the property. So he does not have the increase in value on that because we didn't really uh, we didn't have it in 2019, so he couldn't do a comparison. But for 2020, just 2021, just the technology package will increase the value plus our original projections since we uh, raise rents on renewals and things like that. Um, will the lack of distributions this past year benefit our tax position on our annual W-2 earnings? Or is that solely a cancellation against distribution, distribution of income? Um, uh, it's, you know, it's actually not W-2 earnings, but uh, it's K-1s. Um, but distributions, will that, I'm going to have to ask the CPA on that one. Um, the yeah, and everybody, and everybody's there, situation would be different, so. Yeah. As a new investor, our distributions paid quarterly or monthly. Just so you know, we try and pay those out monthly. And once we get it started, we like to keep the same amount or go up. But every once in a while, we drop down just to make sure that if there's another hiccup, um, our number one goal is to protect the asset. So if we see that we have uh, rough waters ahead or some other problem, um, then we may suspend those. But until then, we pay them monthly. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide and I'll let somebody else look at the questions because I know they're gonna be coming to me. Things to look forward to in 2021. Um, interesting thing, DFW is turning into a tier one market and a tier one market is like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York. And what that basically means is it's, a, it's in the good and, good and bad news for that. The good news is lending is better. The 
good news is the values of the property will go up. The bad news is the values of the properties will go up faster than the rents will. So if you look at rents in San Francisco, New York, uh, Los Angeles, um, it makes more sense to rent than it does to buy. Um, so what that does is that makes it real good for us because it keeps people out of buying homes because that that uh, that difference is too great, but it also uh, and it increases the value of the, of the property. So we'll have less people buying houses because of that, and we'll have better lending possibilities, uh, better debt. Um, we think there's a continued move to more remote working, uh, which is why the internet packages is great timing to add those with people working from home and needing better uh, better internet connection. Also, less urban demand and more suburban demand. So we don't have anything in any downtown areas that would really take a hit. Like I think the Class A downtowns are really going to get hurt. They already have, and it's getting worse. Um, so keeping in the suburbs, which was always a plan, uh, is is very good. Um, greater government spending. I know. I mean, tongue in cheek on looking forward to, but that includes stimulus. So hopefully there will be more programs to help protect the people, which will help get them their rent paid, like uh, the slides that he already put through. Um, and hopefully businesses should open up again. Um, I had to laugh when uh, when Governor Como uh, basically said that, you know, they need to open their businesses now and they're going to do it on January 21st. I thought that was a very uh, funny uh, coincidental timing, but bottom line is we need to get the businesses open open uh, so that we can get people back to work. The And also uh, less uncertainty will support more growth as if we needed more of that. We've been growing like crazy, um, but that uncertainty will, uh, now that we're through the election, we know who it is, we know what to expect, which is, uh, which you know what the, Biden plans are already, but we know what to expect. And it doesn't really matter what the government does. Um, I always love the saying, we had a picture hanging on the wall in the hallway growing up is, you can't adjust the wind, but you can adjust the sails. So whatever happens in the government, we adjust to that. And because of these other things, I think we're gonna be good to go. And my favorite thing, the media will stop talking about Trump in 2021. Now, fan or not, um, just all the media's griping about everything. Um, hopefully they have less to bitch about. So that's something I'm looking forward to in 2021. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Predictions. Um, first off, there's already a lot of cash and a lot of people chasing deals. Now with COVID, there was a lot of people that went on the sidelines and we still saw a huge influx of cash coming into the market and people getting out of other investments there i was talking with one investor who's been getting a you know, a point and a half on his i don't remember what accounts he was getting one and a half percent uh cash flow and that's going to drop to about a quarter percent um here in another month so people are looking to get out of other investments and get them into cash flowing properties and something that will keep up with inflation so now we'll have more people and more money going in, and so there's going to be more competition. Cap rates will stay low. Um, interest rates will only go up slightly. Um, you saw the 10-year Treasury uh, bump up a little bit uh, after everything went down, and so that should show a slight bump in overall rates. Um, we were hoping that property tax values would go down because of the lower income. Of, and of course, we're going to argue that. But I don't think, I think all the property values have um, have stayed pretty stable. And that was because the lower interest rates kept the cap rate, had more cap rate compression. So those values are higher, even though our rents um, didn't go up at the same rate. Now, the bigger concern that I have is all of these municipalities, all these cities, uh, counties, states, schools, um, I'm concerned that they may, may raise the tax rates 
because of how much lost revenue they've had. If you look at some of these projections on the amount of lost revenue the cities, uh, cities st states and counties have lost, it is huge, absolutely huge. And so they're gonna try and make that up somewhere. Um, and also, like I mentioned earlier, property values are gonna go up faster than the rents, which, uh, you know, which is good and bad, uh, good for our valuations, but bad for uh, trying to trying to be able to buy things and still get such a high return that we shoot for. Next slide. Strategies for 2021. We continue to improve our efficiencies. You saw how effective they've been at lowering expenses and doing everything that they can to do that. Um, we're gonna to have to lower our expected return range. Um, my whole, I'm doing this, I always shoot for a 16% partner return with relatively conservative numbers. And we're gonna to have to look at lower expectations in that 10 to 14% range, which will still outstrip most other investments. Um, and in doing this, that way we can get better and newer assets. Uh, you know, get away from the 60s build stuff that plumbing is a continued problem and expenses on repairs are continued problems. So try and get into the newer and better assets with better demographics so that if we continue to have COVID problems um, or, or any other pandemic that may raise its ugly head, um, you know, that we'll be in a better position. Um, we're anticipating having more acquisitions and more opportunities by looking for these better products at a slightly lower return. And we're hoping to, hoping to open a couple of new markets. We're looking at other areas of the country that will have stronger cash flow than DFW will and, uh, and more growth since DFW is so saturated. Next. Now, hopefully everybody saw our presentation on Blue Tahoe Capital. This was a growth fund. This is a growth fund that we just put together and we're buying a bunch of small and mo small mom and pop properties. Think about this, um, just to give a, a quick rundown for those who didn't pay it, didn't listen in on that. First off, this is a growth fund based in Lake Tahoe. Um, if you haven't listened to Charles German, my brother's um, story, he came out and spoke to our group. Um, he basically, in 20 years, did 20 deals, turned $20,000 into a $20 million portfolio. And he's last seven years, he's only been operating Lake Tahoe. So he's our operating partner. And we set up a growth fund. There's only 1,776 units in Lake Tahoe, apartment units of of six units or more per property. So what we're gonna do is have a growth fund and invest and buy up those small mom and pop properties because they're too small for any sophisticated or institutional buyer. But if we can get three or 400 units compiled together out of 1,776, then that's gonna put us in a great position to sell to a larger player. And, um, and Lake Tahoe, they are 4,000 units short of what they need right now, and they've got diminishing land supply. Um, there's the, the cost to build is way too high. Um, there are government agencies that, are, that have restricted building, and they're actually buying up land to turn it back into forest areas. So you're competing with a diminishing supply with an organization that's that's getting rid of supply. So because of that, we have a great growth fund, the 7% preferred return to partners, then a 70-30 split. And then after the partners get 100% of their capital back, plus the 7% preferred return and 70-30 split of cash flow, after the partners get 100% back, then it switch to, switches to a 50-50 split. So. I think that uh, our first property we needed to raise a million one fifty roughly, and uh, we might be right there already. And uh, it just rolled out last two, last Wednesday, and so that was a great opportunity for a growth fund. Very little cash flow, but a preferred return, 
and a lot of growth there. And we're excited about that. And we'll continue. We'll do a new small raise every time we get another property. We've already, we're closing on the first one on the 21st. And we already have two more that we're working contracts on right now with a couple more right behind that. So Blue Tahoe Capital is real exciting. And it's great to have my brother Charles as an operating partner on that. And he's had great success and he oversees the whole thing. So that one's very, very exciting. Next. Now, something that rolls out on this Thursday, this Thursday, watch out for that and register for the webinar on that one, is Village Condos in Waco, Texas. This, was a, this is a condo property built in two different phases, uh, 1982 and 1984 construction. It's got freeway frontage on I-35 and is adjacent to Baylor University and some brand new construction right next to it. We are projecting 16% ROI, and um, this is a value play. And the reason it's a value play, let me give you a, a little bit of uh, history on this one. It was built as condominiums. We have one owner that owns uh, 82 of the 108 units, and there's, they had a neat thing in the condo documents that if 90% of the people vote to sell as one big portfolio uh, of all the units, then they, then all the other owners are forced to sell at that same price. So even though it's a fractured condo deal and village condos, which is a little confusing with village Oaks condos, which we bought a few months ago, this is a fractured condo deal, but we are buying 100% of the units. So we do not have that problem with going to buying the other units. Because we do not have operating history for the whole property though, we are getting uh, a bridge loan to get us 12 months down the road so we can then do a refinance. So there's a small, um, a small cash out refi expected 12 to 14 months after we buy it. And this one rolls out Thursday, so go look for that one. And uh, that one's still projected as 16% per year average return and register for that, watch for that for Thursday. Now we can go to questions. Okay, in all honesty, we, all honesty, we didn't do have any. Uh, we didn't have any new questions that come in uh, since Brian. our last round of questions. Brian. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the email was sent to everyone at 7 p.m. If they want to actually go right now and check their mailboxes uh, to actually sign up for the upcoming webinar. Yeah, I was going to close out with that. And just uh, the the email that Darwin's referring to is a registration email for the Thursday night webinar where we're going to, uh, Darwin's going to provide his analysis and presentation for Village Condos. So it went out at seven o'clock tonight. So check your email boxes and register for that and uh, look forward to seeing you again or talking to you again on Thursday. Um, okay, I, I, do see have a, a I see a couple of questions. Okay. Want me to go ahead and get these, Brian? Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, first off, uh, is Waco for sophisticated? Yes, that is a 506B, which means that we can have 35 unaccredited but sophisticated investors so we're not going to advertise for that uh, but we are not going to do outside advertising so it's only our current group and that'll be a 3.8 million dollar um, raise um, Villa Condos same question for accredited or not it's it's open for everybody and I love Ben's question here do you have any updates on the co-sponsor program now Ben is our newest co-sponsor and um, and hopefully you watched our podcast with that Ben was on, and that was actually an interview done by Julian. And Ben is a, he's an executive with a big company, which I can't say who it is, but they're one of the, they've got one of the top uh, training, sales training programs in the country. And he is, he is uh, very well connected in that. And so Ben is our next co-sponsor to be able to buy a property. We're currently looking for a property uh, for him, but uh, but definitely look out for that and watch what he's doing. Minimum invested investment on villa condos is 50,000. Uh, same thing on, uh, on Blue Tahoe. Any other questions? Does our team have any questions they wanna add in there? 
No, all good. Any, um, any investor projected income gains, hypothetical examples for $100,000 investments over one to five years? Okay, uh, the question is hypothetical examples uh, and projections for Blue Tahoe. We are anticipating, uh, of course, our goal is, is an average of 20% per year. That is our goal. Um, if we're at 16, I'm happy. Um, but it is something that is a growth fund where we will be reinvesting re refi proceeds, things like that. So it's not a cash flow, uh, not a cash flow play. It's a growth, a growth play. And we basically did the same thing with our two properties in Hawaii. They're not big cash flow generators, but they definitely generated a lot of equity growth. And that's, uh, and that's what we're looking for is equity growth on these. <laughs> Next question, are we able to get the internet package for our home? Um, I doubt it, but Brian, you can answer that one. <laughs> uh, I have already asked. Uh, no, sorry. One of the things that I didn't mention, though, just a side note here, is that as part of this, uh, one of the expenses will benefit because we will get the free, the service will be free to our offices. So there's one additional expense that uh, we will we'll, uh, take away from our expense category. Okay. And can you talk about how Villas, Villas is a value play? Okay, villa, um, village condominiums is probably what he's talking about as far as a value play. It's a value play just because we're doing a bridge loan and we do get a cash out refi to come out to partners and we are increasing the value. We're taking it from a condo property into an apartment property. So that's the main reason why it's a, a value play. Let's see, any more questions? Plans for distributions on Silver Creek, Brian? Uh, for those of you, and I, I know we had uh, last month, we held a, uh, a webinar specifically for the Silver Creek investors. Um, again, we do not feel like uh, right now we can do that. We went through that in detail. I'll be glad. I, I don't want to bore everybody, but the bottom line is we're just not in a position to do that right now at Silver Creek. I shared some of the numbers with you tonight. Uh, and just being fully honest, but uh, if you would like, if you were not able to participate in that Silver Creek webinar where we answered everybody's questions and a lot of information went through, let me know. I'd be glad to uh, share that with you. We recorded that and sent that out to all Silver Creek investors as well. Okay, I'm going to cut off the questions and basically uh, hit this last slide. If you have any questions, you want to invest, anything else, your team to talk to is David Tuttle and Garrett Stroud. And there's their contact information. Reach out to them, um, and they can answer whatever questions you have. And if not, they'll jump on the phone and get those answers directly from myself or Brian. So thank you all. Any other final words, Brian? No, just uh, thank everybody again for your time tonight. We know that your time is valuable. We appreciate you spending it with us. We look forward to the fact that we can share this information with you in full transparency. Uh, as Mo said, please just look for the email to register for the Village Condos webinar set for Thursday evening, where Darwin shares his analysis of the Village Condos deal, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much.